Ruth and Esther for beginners. Uh, this is the second lesson, The Right Place, The Right Time, story of uh, Esther. In our, uh, in our previous lesson, uh, we uh, observed uh, the quality of uh, Ruth. We did Ruth Esther, we did Ruth last time. We observed the quality of Ruth's love for her mother-in-law as both women were widowed and left stranded in a foreign land. We talked about that last week. And uh, the lesson was called the Chords of, uh, Chords of Love. Chords of Love, and we said the five chords of, uh, five chords of love uh, were demonstrated by Ruth uh, and her commitment to stay with her mother-in-law. Um, and uh, in that commitment, to, we looked at the, the various uh, qualities that she had that uh, came out uh, or produced a loving relationship. Um, and briefly, the court of kindness, the court of loyalty, hard work, court of patience, and the court of faith in God. And the point made was that cultivating and strengthening any type of relationship, you know, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, you know, a husband, wife, friends, uh, business associates, whatever, um, you need these type of cords in order to uh, strengthen and build uh, a uh, personal uh, relationship. So that was last week, we talked about Ruth. Today, uh, we examine the story of Esther, a very different kind of woman caught up in a very different set of uh, circumstances. However, like Ruth, Esther showed a great faith and courage in saving not only what was left of her family, but was called upon to save her people and her nation. I, uh, I hope you've completed your assignment and have read the book of Esther, just 10 short uh, chapters, since we're going to be summarizing the story, focusing on the main lessons. I was talking to someone before the class and saying, you know, these books like uh, Ruth or Esther, they're narratives. You know, they, uh, she went here, she did this, he did this, they did that, you know, it's a story, it's a narrative, you know, and it's a much easier for you to read the narrative on your own than having to take up time in the class to read these, uh, type, of, uh, these type of books. Now, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a saying that is often used to explain the uh, success that some people experience. They say, well, I was just in the right place at the right time. Time. I think that's happened to all of us one, one time or another in our lives. This has also been said by many who have survived fires or natural disasters as they took cover in the right spot, in the nick of time to, uh, to save their lives. Many people think that being in the right place at the right time is a matter of luck. Boy, was I lucky. I hate that when they say that, but boy, was I lucky, or it was guesswork, or you know, somehow it was all them. As Christians, however, uh, we believe uh, what Paul says in Romans 8, 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And in context, he's talking about uh, the working of good for our salvation. But in a broader context, we don't believe in blind luck. We don't, we don't believe in blind luck. We don't believe in fate. We believe in an eternal God who is aware of and sovereign over every event of our lives. We, we believe that it is God who creates opportunities for good and provides blessings. He does that, not luck, not fate. And of course, God is the one that permits evil to a certain degree uh, before he judges, before he punishes. Uh, we should never think that, you know, when we see some of the evil in the world, that it will go unpunished, that justice will not be done. Sometimes the justice isn't done in our lifetime. Sometimes it seems that some people, some leaders, get away with everything and they live to an old age and they're buried with pomp and ceremony, but the, the, there's always a day of reckoning and that, that day will come for, for all of us. Uh, and of course, for those who, uh, who do evil in this world. Either way, God is a God of history. He's a God of events 
and each event is either specifically created by him to accomplish his will, or it's permitted by him so that he might accomplish his will despite opposition. So if you've ever been in the right place at the right time, it was no fluke. God put you there for a specific purpose. A great example of this is found, uh, as we know, in the story of Esther, described in an Old Testament book of the same name. And so I want to use her story to teach us a couple of lessons about being in the right place uh, in the right time. Uh, before we get to that, let's, let's talk about the, uh, the book of Esther itself and the story that it says. A uh, little background information on Esther and the times that she lived in so that you can get some perspective. The time frame is the middle fourth century before Christ. This is after the uh, Jews were exiled and remained in exile for a, for a certain time and then began to filter back to uh, their homeland somewhere in that time frame historically. For a little more than a century, the 12 tribes of Israel lived together as a single nation ruled by a king. There were three kings who ruled, Saul, David, and Solomon. We're pretty familiar with their story. After Solomon's death, there was a civil unrest, civil war, which led to a division, creating a north and a south kingdom who were constantly battling one another. With time, the northern kingdom was defeated and was deported by the larger pagan Assyrian kingdom that existed at that time. And the northern kingdom was never reestablished. Sometime later, the southern kingdom, uh, which had Jerusalem as its religious and its political uh, capital, was also overtaken by the much larger pagan nation of the Babylonians. They are the ones that defeated the uh, Assyrians and uh, subsequently warred against the southern kingdom and overtook it and uh, um, deported its people into exile back to their nation. The difference was the northern kingdom, they were dispersed throughout all different nations, whereas the Babylonians exiled the people back to their uh, nation. Now through various prophets like Jeremiah, for example, God had promised that Judah, the southern kingdom, and its main city, Jerusalem, would one day be rebuilt. He had uh, prophesied that they would be gone for 70 years and then the people would start coming uh, back and uh, inhabit the city again. Uh, that scripture reference, Jeremiah 25, verses nine to 13, if you're wondering. And of course, the people did begin to filter back under the leadership of various uh, individuals a couple of which uh, were Nehemiah and Ezra. If you are, were in the class that, uh, well, several weeks ago, we talked about their time period and the type of things they did, reestablish the city and the temple worship. And of course, Nehemiah helped lead the uh, effort to rebuild the wall around uh, Jerusalem. Now, while the Jews were in captivity in Babylon, they established houses and businesses and farms and so on and so forth, groves there. And they settled down in their new home in a foreign land. Now, a curious thing happened while they were in Babylonian captivity. The Babylonians themselves were defeated by a new and a powerful military nation called Persia. Once they conquered the Babylonian empire, the Persians maintained the foreign captivity of the Jews by their former masters, the Babylonians. And so you have this interesting situation where the Jews remained in exile in a pagan and foreign land, but now by a new set of captors, the Persians, today, modern day uh, Iran. So there's just a little history timeline and I've put the dates in a very general sense uh, uh, about the things that took place and uh, where we are at for our story of Esther. 
So the story of uh, Esther is written in narrative style I mentioned with the writer quite simply telling the story of this beautiful Jewish girl who became queen of this great nation, Persia. We don't have time to read the book as I mentioned, so I'll summarize it for you. We begin with uh, King uh, Ahasuerus, Xerxes uh, in the Greek, same, if you see Xerxes or Ahasuerus, you think uh, two, two different kings, no, same king, just different names. He ruled Persia from 485 to 465 BC. He was one of the most illustrious rulers who ruled over the ancient world. 127, he divided his kingdom into 127 provinces, uh, stretching from India to Africa. Think about that, we have 50 states. Canada has 10 provinces. Uh, this uh, nation had 127 provinces. Uh, think about how huge uh, that was. He um, uh, planned a, a military campaign against Greece at some point in his rule. And before departing, he had a great feast for his noblemen and his governors to which he invited his royal wife, Queen Vashti. He wanted to show her off and she was insulted by this and refused to make an appearance. And so, long story short, the king deposed her and searched throughout the kingdom for a new queen, a young virgin, to take uh, her place as wife and queen. They did this by seeking and gathering the most beautiful women in the realm into the king's palace to be prepared to meet the king so he could then uh, choose. This is where Esther uh, comes in. Esther was a, um, she was a Jewish orphan girl. She was being raised by her cousin, who is called Mordecai. And both of these were among the Jewish exiles living in Persian, in the Persian kingdom. And so the story tells us that Esther is gathered up along with other young women and uh, over time she becomes the king's wife. He chooses her because he favors her the most of all the women that they've brought. And she becomes uh, his wife and the new queen. However, the king was not aware that she was a Jewish exile. Now we uh, kind of introduce the, uh, the villain in the plot. The villain is Haman. Haman, uh, name, his name means a noise or tumult. Today we'd say troublemaker, and he, he, had the, he had the right name, Haman. He was the king's prime minister and he managed the king's affairs and he was very powerful. And, he, and because of this, he received homage and deference from the lesser nobles and officials. And at some point, Haman comes into contact with Mordecai. This is Esther's cousin, remember. And although he wasn't aware of the relationship between Esther and, uh, and Mordecai. So during their meetings, uh, Mordecai, a Jew, of course, would refuse to bow down before Haman. This would be a sign of worship that would be forbidden uh, any Jewish person. Of course, this made Haman angry and in order to retaliate, he organized a plot to kill every Jewish exile in the empire. He couldn't execute his plan without the king's authorization, so what does he do? He convinces the king that the Jews were planning a rebellion and had to be eliminated. And so the king went along with the plan and he ordered a decree that all Jews were to be killed on a certain day and if you killed that Jew, you could take his property while you're at it. Little motivation there. And the king signs this decree. Well, at this point, Mordecai, who is Esther's cousin, gets word of this plan to eliminate all the Jews in the empire. And he goes to Esther and asks her to intercede with the king to save her people. At first, she hesitates because coming before the king without being asked, even though they have been married now for about five years, uh, coming before him without being asked is a capital offense and she could lose her life. And so in his answer to her doubts, 
Mordecai says the words that can be applied to so many key moments, to so many lives throughout history. These words are found in Esther 4 verse 13, and he says to Esther as she doubts, as she hesitates to make the move, the following. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. These words galvanize her into action, and she risks her life in pleading her people's case before the king while revealing Haman's plot. Now, since a Persian's king decree could not be rescinded, the king made another decree giving the Jews permission to defend themselves and their property against any attack on that day. I want to talk for a minute about the concept that a king's ruling could not be changed or canceled. You know, you read that and it almost looks like a little, uh, little story hook, you know, to kind of make things work. You know, uh, you know, you wonder, was that a real thing? That the king's decree could not be rescinded? And yes, it was. This concept was often associated with the legal principle of rex non potest peccare, or the king can do no wrong which reflects the idea of sovereign immunity. We are talking a lot about that in the news these days about a former president, right? Immunity of the president. Well, here you had sovereign immunity, the immunity of the king. Now this principle historically meant that the decisions and actions of the king were considered infallible and could not be questioned or reversed. And there are a few reasons behind the establishment, uh, the establishment of such a legal precedent because it was, a, uh, it, it was a common legal concept at that time. It wasn't just that king, all kings had this. A couple of reasons for that. One, the divine right of kings, for example. In uh, medieval Europe, monarchs often claimed to rule by divine right, asserting that their authority came directly from God. This belief contributed to the idea that the king's decisions were inherently just and beyond human challenge. After all, if you're ruling in the name of God, you're not going to make any mistakes. And uh, you know, uh, <laughs> he was the one that made the rules and so no one could kind of dispute him. Another reason, uh, perhaps a more common sense one, was the stability to maintain stability and order. The maintenance of social order and political stability was a crucial concern of many historical societies. And so allowing challenges or reversals of the king's decisions could be seen as a threat to this stability, potentially leading to unrest and conflict among the people. A third reason for this ruling, uh, centralized authority. In systems with absolute monarchs, the king held centralized authority and the legal system was often an extension of the king's will. And so questioning or overturning the king's decisions could be viewed as undermining the very foundation of the legal and the political uh, structure. And then one more reason, lack of separation of powers. We often hear that in our nation, there are separation of powers. For what reason? Well, so that all the power doesn't rest only with one group or one person. And so for the same reason they had, uh, you know, they didn't have this concept in those days. Uh, in many historical contexts, there was no clear separation of powers between the legislative and the executive and the judicial branches of government. The king, uh, he often played the central role in all of these functions, making it more challenging to establish you know, a system of checks and balances. He ruled uh, everyone and everything. So it's important to note that these principles were more prevalent in absolute monarchies and, and feudal systems, and they have largely been replaced by more modern legal and political concepts in uh, contemporary uh, government. Uh, in modern democracies, the idea of the infallibility of rulers has been replaced 
by what we call the rule of law, constitutional principles, and the various accountability mechanisms that are put into place. Uh, so this is just a little side note. Uh, so the king's decree about killing all the Jews in the kingdom and thus confiscating their property, this could not be rescinded. It was a bad idea. It was an idea promoted by a bad man for a selfish purpose. Uh, he knew how to use, Haman knew how to use the system, but nevertheless, the decree had to stand uh, because it was, it was law. However, nothing stopped the king from making an additional decree which permitted the Jews uh, to uh, defend himself. And of course, that's exactly uh, what uh, uh, took place. And so we know that uh, in the end, the Jews defeated their enemies on the day that was originally set to destroy them. Haman uh, was executed by the king for his lies and his plot. Mordecai was given Haman's position as prime minister over the empire. And Esther remained a, a queen and the beloved wife of uh, the king. Now, uh, usually the story happily ends here with the footnote that the Jews continue to celebrate this great victory or this historical event to this day with the Feast of Purim. Now, just in case you've forgotten, uh, we were originally talking about being in the right place at the right time, and how Esther was a good example of this. Not only is Esther's story a good example, but it also provides us with a few lessons about the times that we find ourselves in the right place at the right time. So here are a couple of lessons based on the key idea that we've read about in Esther's book. First idea, recognize that it is God's timing and not luck. It isn't luck, it isn't fate, it's God's timing. Instead of patting ourselves on the back or thanking Lady Luck for the good fortune, Let's realize that God is the one who got you where you are, not luck, not even talent. You know, there are a lot of people who have talent. Go to any uh, off-Broadway or go to any regional theater, for example, and you'll see marvelous actors and actresses, you know, uh, 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 participating in plays and musicals, you know, and you're thinking, wow, that person, they, they sing just as well as, as the guy or the girl in Broadway. How many athletes, you know, excellent athletes, you know, who, who, who kind of make it up the ranks, but they just don't make it to the final, you know. What are the odds for somebody to get into, to break into the NBA, you know, hundreds of thousands to one? And so we have a choice in our lives of acknowledging God and searching for a way to serve him with our position, with our right place, right time, opportunity, or we can spend our benefits on ourselves. For example, the rich can try to get richer or learn where God wants them to practice liberality. The talented can seek to glorify themselves or glorify God uh, with their talent. We're here for God's purpose, and when we recognize this, we can make the most of our right time, right place moment. Uh, a good example, you know, I, I enjoy uh, boxing as a sport, and I use boxing uh, you know, images in, in several lessons. And there's a, a boxer uh, who's certainly been in the right place in the right time. His name is Floyd Mayweather. Uh, he's an undefeated champion, he's retired now. Uh, 50 wins and no losses. That's an incredible record for a, box, a professional boxer to have 50 wins and, and no losses. But if you watch him on TV, if you've never seen what he does, I mean, he wears the gold chains and you know, uh, and, he, and he has $100 bills that he throws around. He, he, you know, with his lighter, he lights a you know, $1,000 bill on fire and he just throws the money around like it doesn't mean anything, you know. And, uh, I am the greatest type thing. That, that, that's the way that he's used his 
right time, right moment uh, uh, opportunity. And then you see other athletes uh, uh, and uh, they have a great success. And what do they do with their success? Well, you know, you see them uh, working with the children. Uh, you see them, uh, you know, uh, being a spokespersons for uh, uh, right to life or uh, other uh, beneficial uh, things that benefit uh, society. You have some athletes who are, uh, you know, believers, uh, like uh, Tim Tebow a while back uh, was a, for a short time an FL, uh, NFL quarterback, and yet always uh, witnessed his faith uh, without shame or embarrassment, you know. Uh, he took advantage of his right place, right time moment to honor God and to uh, confess, uh, confess Christ. So the point I'm trying to make here is we need to remember that we're here for God's purpose. And when we recognize this, we can make the most of our right time, right place moment. Lesson number, lesson number two, recognize that God's place and time are not always easy or pleasant. I've just talked about you know, the times where it's good, but sometimes the right place, the right time is not easy. Esther's story, for example, it had a happy ending, but she didn't know that when the plot to kill all the Jews was hatched, and she had to risk her life by going to the king. She didn't, she didn't know that would happen. You know, she thought, wow, <laughs> because of something I have nothing to do with, my beauty, the way I look, uh, I've been asked to become the queen. Uh, I go from being a, a poor Jewish you know, a girl, uh, not actually part of this society, with no position, no advantage, no role, and then all of a sudden, boom, I'm the queen. Uh, one of the more powerful and privileged people in, in the kingdom. Uh, so she thought that was it, you see, you see my point? She thought, well, that, that was my moment and I've, I've, I've got it now and I, thank you God, thank you so much. It's wonderful what you've done for me. I'll try to be a good queen, you know, a good wife, a good mother. You know, maybe she was thinking that. She wasn't thinking maybe she's gonna to have to risk all of that plus her life in order to save uh, her people. Sometimes our time and place means that God will require a sacrifice from us, a giving of ourselves for a cause that doesn't seem very noble uh, or uh, spectacular at the time. For example, maybe our right place, right time moment will mean that we'll have to pull back on a promising career in order to save a relationship. That point is better made you know, in, a, in a course on marriage. In a course on marriage, I usually say, don't ever go somewhere where you can't bring your partner, your spouse. Don't rise to a point where you can't bring your spouse with you. Don't do that. Or maybe giving up our best years in order to raise a handicapped child or care for a sick family member. I just, Lisa and I just went to a funeral on Saturday for Maury King. Uh, Maury King was uh, very sick, spent the majority of his life uh, in a, um, a mental health uh, institute, mental health care hospital. He was very sick, wonderful, wonderful guy. He and I used to play the accordion together, I mean, 40 years ago, you know, when we were uh, young. And he spent most of his life there and they had, he and uh, Francis, his wife, they only had one son. And, they, uh, and that son uh, took care of his father. It never branched out on his own. Even to this day, lives with his mother. Now she's ill. His dad died, now his mother is very fragile. He's taking care of her now. Imagine being uh, your whole life, you're a caretaker for someone in your family. Or perhaps uh, it means that you may lose money or time so that the work of the church can go ahead. Some people say, well, you don't expect me to serve in this role. Uh, I don't have time to be a deacon. I'm too busy making money. 
I don't have time to step up and serve as an elder. Oh, my business is booming, I, I can't, you know. It's hard to be at a crucial time and place that brings no honor, that brings no immediate reward, that doesn't even bring the encouragement of other people. It's hard to be at a time and place where the only motivation you have is the knowledge that it's the right thing to do or it's my thing to do. No one else can step in and do that. I remember, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's part of the history, our history together, you and I here at Choctaw, uh, working in Choctaw uh, and, and uh, uh, I left here and, and uh, I was offered a job in California. I want to, I want to tell you something. If you come from Canada <laughs> and you're offered a job in California, that's like dying and going to heaven. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> six months of winter. You, know, you people who come from the Northeast, you know, Bob over there, he knows what I'm talking about. You know. Six months of winter and, and someone said, would you come and work in San Diego, California? Oh my goodness, my office up on the second floor, I had a big picture window. I could see palm trees, you know, I could go to the beach, you know. And I, get, I, was, I was saying to myself, and I'm getting paid to do this. This is crazy, I'm getting paid to do it. It's wonderful, oh my goodness, this is, thank you, Lord, you know. Right place, right time. They just needed a guy like me. Uh, right place, right time. And then I got a call from a guy. I got a call from a guy in Montreal. And he said, uh, hey, how's it going, Mike, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he said, you know, we're having problems here. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, you need me to come down and do a, you know, a seminar or something? No, we need you to come back. Come back? Well, yeah, you know, the church that you and Lee's planted, it was going great when we left. Uh, it's starting to fall apart. There have been divisions. Uh, people have argued, a whole bunch of people have left, you know, what was a pretty healthy church of about 100 people, now we're down to 15, 16, 17 people. And he said to me, he said, you have to come back. He said, you're a son of Montreal. You're a son of Montreal. Meaning I was a Montrealer, I spoke French, I spoke English, I understood the culture, the, you know. If, if, if you search through the entire uh, brotherhood of the churches of Christ, preachers of the churches of Christ, I dare say there weren't, there weren't many sons of Montreal. That was my right time and right place. And so Lise and I packed up and we went back to help a church that was dwindling and struggling. It was, a, it was a great seven years. It was, wow, it was, it was where Bible talk was born. I thought, well, here I am in California and preachers, they really don't work for the money. But I was making you know, the best salary I had ever made. It was a fairly wealthy church. Going back into mission work where I'd have to go around and beg people to, <laughs> support the work at a time when it was, you know, hey, you know, it's time to kind of go into second gear, let the younger ministers, you know, do the horsework and so on and so forth. To go back into mission work, no secretary, you got to do everything yourself. And Hal moved to Montreal with Emily to be close to us. And he had a bright idea, let's start streaming our Wednesday night class, you know the story. I didn't know that when they said, come back. Lisa and I, we cried all the way going back. <laughs> but I'm glad we did. Look at the opportunity that God gave to us. Sometimes you're not at a prime place and it's not a good time. But remember, it's still God's time and His place for you. And if you do whatever you do, recognizing this, He'll not only give you the power to do what you need to do, He'll flood your heart with peace as you do it. 
Never regret that phone call. Never regret it. And then one more lesson. Recognize that God can do it with or without you. Had Esther copped out, God would have offered a time and place chance to somebody else. For example, Judas, you know, one of Jesus' apostles, had all the same opportunities as all the other apostles. Judas wasted his moment and Matthias stepped into the apostolic ministry and the reward that he would have received. Time and place are great opportunities, but they also serve to judge what we're made of, what kind of faith we have, and how far we're willing to go for the Lord. I've certainly found that out in my life. Every time I think, uh, I'm in a good place here, this is a good, I can relax here, you know. Uh, he always comes by and says, well, if, if, if you're willing to take another step of faith, I'll lead you over there. When your time and place occurs, realize that you can be replaced. So do what you have to with humility, knowing that your opportunity to serve or to give or to lead or to stand up or to die is a great personal blessing. That's what it is. Don't waste it. Don't refuse it because God can give the opportunity to someone else. He's not short of servants. Remember, we're the ones that need him. He doesn't need us. Well, I, I've spoken a lot about being in the right place at the right time, but I would like to finish by warning you to avoid being in the wrong place at the wrong time as well. The wrong place and time is being with the unbelievers or being with the disobedient and being with the unfaithful when Jesus comes for you personally in death or comes for all of us in the judgment. We know that this time will one day come for all of us. So while it is still today, make sure you are in the right place. And that is in the place where Jesus is. And everyone who confesses their belief in him, repents of their sins and are baptized in his name will be in the right place and the right time with God whenever he comes. And one of the passages, of course, Acts 2.38. And so I encourage you to make the most of the time and the place that God has given you. And you can do this briefly by glorifying him with your success and accepting his sovereignty over every time and place in your life and making the most of the time and place that he's given you now or in the future. I pray that God bless you at all times as you seek to know his will for you each and every day.